Welcome to the Greater Central Florida Multifamily Investor Group, where we focus on investing where it makes sense. Here's your host, Ismael Ray Reyes. This show is about uh, folks that live in greater, greater Central Florida that are potentially looking to invest here or elsewhere. And it's also about people that live elsewhere that are interested in, in, uh, in investing in the area. So it's a good way to, to connect specifically with uh, either like-minded people in the area or people that, are, that have deals. And, if you, you know, if, uh, and uh, there's, there's always, in fact, you know, folks here, are gonna, you know, the folks that are here, um, I've already done deals with, with a good portion of the folks that are on the call already, or at least discuss deals because we meet at events like this. So that's that kind of the beauty of this is, is just being able to do that. And, and the whole point is, you know, it's not about uh, specific, you know, assets. It's about, you know, the location first and foremost. And then you look for assets. So we look for places where it makes the most sense to, to, to invest there, you know, and, and obviously, you know, the tide, what's that say, how's that saying go, you know, you, you got to swim with the current, you go, you go against the current, you're not, you're not going to go very far. It's mm -hmm. the same way in this business. And so that's, that's one of the keys. And I, I just hope that, you know, certainly certain central Florida continues to be this, this place where people just either move down here or, or folks are certainly wanting to invest here. And there's also folks with money that are, you know, a lot of them more in, in South Florida, but certainly in certain for Central Florida that are looking to to invest in other places. And and I and I don't exclusively invest here because it just again wherever it makes the most sense, that's where we go. Brad is uh, serves as a senior associate for Franklin Street Insurance Services in the Tampa corporate headquarters. Uh, uh, he is a he's currently a producer for the firm's national accounts team which ensures over 450,000 units across the United States, uh, it, it, which is comprised of both market rate and subsidized housing. So quite a bit of work there. In this role, uh, Brad Young leverages his knowledge of the insurance marketplace to assemble tailored insurance programs that fit the needs of nationally diverse commercial real estate portfolios representing both private and institutional, institutional owners and managers. He works with his team uh, to help clients assess their needs, organize agency resources, structure competitive solutions, and improve and ultimately improving a portfolio's operating income through reduced insurance costs. That's the that's the key, right? Every everyone knows we need insurance. It's how do we get insurance at a at a at a that covers us for most things but isn't going to cost us an arm and a leg. So we're competitive in these deals. So I'll finish off. Brad received a bachelor's degree in business from Florida State University with a focus on risk management and insurance, real estate and professional sales. So with that, I'll go, on, go ahead and turn it over to Brad Young, man. Thanks for having, uh, for coming on. Cool. Well, appreciate the introduction and uh, thanks for having me. So yeah, as Ray said, okay, I can start sharing my screen here too. So we can jump to that part. Uh, my name is Brad Young, um, work for Franklin Street. We are a commercial real estate services firm first and foremost. And what makes this company kind of unique and one of the reasons I decided to join this team is we're a commercial real estate services firm first and foremost. So we understand how other, or other real estate professionals tend to think, uh, but we are able to offer insurance services, which allows a different perspective. Uh, like Ray said, you know, a lot of insurance people get kind of caught up in, in the insurance side of things. But the reason you guys are here is to make money, to go buy deals, to grow your portfolio, and you need a trusted advisor. So that's kind of our goal. And in order to do so, um, flip to the next page, you know, we develop a team around the need of multifamily owners and operators in order to kind of target the most, uh, the most difficult portion of the insurance market. Uh, it's very easy to go out and insure a large office building that's, you know, solid block construction that people are only in eight hours of the day. They don't really have a lot of need. Anybody can do that. But our clients are high acquisition focused. You know, they buy maybe older properties that they're looking to do value add work. They're, you know, 
find stuff that people are living in, they're partying in, they're cooking in, they're doing all these different things that make it a very risky asset. And it's all a class that's comprised of mostly structures that are built out of wood and, you know, are susceptible to hurricanes, fires, you know, everything under the sun. So we decided to build out a team that helps service this target need, because unless you're a specialist in it, you are really having a tough time providing that value to your clients to make yourself different than everybody else out there that says they work in insurance. So this is kind of, uh, you know, the team we developed. I think we're actually a little bit larger this now than just the people on here now. But we're about 25 to 30 individuals comprised of various producers, but we have brokerage and placement teams, which help uh, assign, that they help build the tailored uh, insurance solutions and take whatever, you know, portfolio out to market. We've got our acquisition lenders compliance team, which helps with new purchases, uh, talking to lenders, working uh, insurance negotiations on coverage requirements, um, things on that day-to-day -day business. We've got our portfolio administration that might handle certificates and uh, general questions and the traditional um, kind of labor work that uh, goes on to servicing an account. And the last main kind of cornerstone of what we have that makes us a little bit different is having a uh, claims advocacy, advocacy and risk management team that, you know, you buy insurance. Uh, so if there ever is an issue, you've got some policy that will help cover you. Now, a lot of people don't want to be, you know, aren't as savvy in the insurance world and they need a team to help them uh, kind of navigate the waters. And we wanted to make sure we kind of offer that to our clients in order to help them uh, not feel like they're out there on their own when it comes to making sure they're properly indemnified for a, uh, any type of claim. One of the other things I always like to throw in here too is you can see we've got a data analytics team and a client engagement team. We're always trying to be, you know, uh, on the forefront and trying to you know, stay ahead of the curve and use data and clients uh, experience and everything they provide us in order to better service our clients and kind of, like I said, be ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. So just a general insurance overview is where I like to start. You know, you can kind of break this down into a couple key factors. You know, the first is why do people purchase insurance? The easy answer is to say, protect your investment. You know, that's what everybody in the insurance world traditionally says thinking as kind of a real estate owner and, you know, thinking of the uh, same way our clients tend to focus and tend to think, they always say they want to purchase the insurance that meets the lender's requirements so they can close that deal at a affordable cost, get their underwriting numbers to be where they expected them to be, have no surprises and wrap that up and just focus on growing their portfolio and feel comfortable that their agent's getting them coverages that will, you know, cover them in even of loss. And the last part is making sure you remain profitable. One of the uh, reasons I threw out this, you know, cash flow chart. I'm sure everybody's looking at OMS all the time, looking at their pro forma numbers. But something people always kind of forget is a lot of these pro formas are uh, thrown together by, you know, whatever broker is putting together the deal that wants to make their property look uh, as profitable as possible. That they're trying to sell so they can get the deal done. But that doesn't really look out for the best interests of our owners and our buyers, excuse me. And the reason I mentioned that is, you know, this is just a line item number, but it's one of the most variable expenses that could be on your line item when you're underwriting a deal. Uh, I love to throw in this deal right here because, you know, you see a $116,000 insurance number, you say, oh, that seems easy. That seems very reachable. If, especially if the previous was, you know, 346 bucks a door, you assume 400, great, no surprises, no hiccups. Well, this doesn't tell you at all that the property has a big consideration called uh, Federal Pacific Paneling, which actually ended up, the insurance cost ended up being closer to 600 bucks a door. So if you don't know what's going on and you unfortunately bid too low on that deal or don't factor that type of stuff in, you can be at quite a shock. And that's the type of stuff that we always try to, you know, look out for our clients, you know, help them understand that ahead of time, let them know what they look for and uh, help them do it at an affordable metric so they can make sure they're choosing the right deals. Well, you got so many, so much capital and so much ability, you might as well spend your money on the best deals, not the ones that uh, are going to be challenging later on. So that's really the, the why insurance is important. The uh, next part of it is what are the lines of coverage? You know, everybody talks about it. They think, you know, property insurance is there. They 
say there's liability insurance, they, you know, throw the words umbrella coverage around all the time. Uh, the traditional four lines though break down to property or hazard, the general liability, the excess liability or umbrella coverage, and then flood coverage. And the reason these four are all good to know is you have three lines that will always be required by any type of agency debt, you know, any type of lender that's going to give you money to make sure that their asset is covered. Understanding those lines help you make sure you're buying the right coverage that's affordable and not just whatever the lender says, oh, hey, go out and get this pricing or go out and get this coverage. Because if you're buying a whole bunch of extra coverage for no reason, that's taking money out of your pocket. And that's inevitably obviously going to impact uh, you know, your profitability and why you, why you at the end of the day buy these uh, coverages. The one main coverage that I always like to mention, a lot of people think umbrella coverage sits above all of the policies, but that is a policy only for general liability. So I like to include this little graph here for anybody who's new to get a visual conceptual idea of what those look like. And, you know, if you have to have a picture in your mind of what you're buying, because it's obviously just a piece of paper, you know, this gives you kind of a representation of it. Uh, between property and umbrella, or property and liability, excuse me, they are based off of two different aspects, but your lender will tell you the limits you've got to purchase. They'll tell you all the general coverage requirements, all those types of, um, uh, items. And after you have your property and liability, the last piece that might be there and might be some type of requirement is what's called your flood insurance. Um, give a quick overview of those, you know, property is going to cover your fire, your hail event, your lightning storm, any type of general, you know, water damage that's not a result of a flood. Your liability is covering your shoot and, uh, sorry, your slip and falls, your shootings, your assault and batteries, your, uh, you know, any type of general negligence and your excess liability covers if those claims, you know, go even higher or more expensive than what you were expecting. Um, your flood coverage is for storm surge. Some type of big hurricane comes, causes, you know, a big uh, flood event that wipes out your building. So that's kind of the general, uh, the general simplistic things that each of these are watching out for. Now, the last part of that is really how do you determine what coverage you are going to need to purchase? Uh, this is always something I love to talk about because people tend to think once you request or once your lender tells you what coverage that you need to purchase, that's the end all be all. One of the ways to get a more competitive edge against your competition out there is by negotiating the terms that your lender gives you. And a lot of people don't realize that you have flexibility to push back in order to reduce your coverage limits. And this is absolutely crucial to do before you close that loan. As soon as you close a deal, you've lost all leverage. You now, the lender is not, not interested in reducing coverage limits, reducing or uh, making any changes because why do they have to? You know, they've already got you uh, locked into these requirements. And a great example of that is if you were to say five years ago, a care or a lender is requiring a $10 million limit of umbrella, that's a pretty affordable, reasonable cost. They were, you know, it might be 20 bucks a door, which is nothing. Now the market's changed a lot. It's not as forgiving as it used to be. And that same coverage might be $40 a door, might be 60 bucks a door, depending on where you're at. And that's a big shock. And if you have a requirement that says that, and that lender doesn't want to go back and you know reduce those coverage limits, you are stuck with purchasing that additional coverage, which you probably don't really need. Um, oh, sorry there, flipped ahead a little bit too much. Um, and once, if you don't negotiate that on the front end, you're locked into that requirements and they're going to make you purchase it, assume that cost, and it's going to obviously negatively affect your cash flows. But if you are able to work with an uh, agent that understands what things you should be negotiating on the front end, that's going to have a, a big impact on the flexibility later on. Um, another great example on that is, let's say, because the market's always changing. The insurance market's in a state of hardening right now. And for 14 years, it was 
in a soft market. The last maybe two, it's been in a hard market. Over those 14 years, people were throwing out coverages left and right. It was easy. It was no big deal. They were trying to win deals. Now carriers are much more restrictive in what they give out. And that additional little coverage that you're locked into could be a huge expense item that you don't want to purchase or you don't want to purchase through your loan proceeds. Um, so there's just little things like that that I always love to mention because it's all that front end work and making sure things are done accurately so you don't have that headache on the back end, which is a great parallel with, to the insurance world, right? You buy coverage up front so you can indemnify yourself and feel comfortable later on and don't have to think about it again. Insurance is obviously not the most fun thing for everybody, but it's something that you want to feel comfortable at the time of loss. So um, the last one in there too, I always like to mention is people don't realize that flood insurance can be frequently negotiated. Uh, this is something that could be a huge cost burden if you don't uh, know what you have to purchase and if you don't lessen the limit as much as possible. On a small property, let's say it's 50 units and you have to purchase some type of flood coverage, you could be looking at maybe a thousand bucks a building. You could be looking at a minimum flood policy of 25 grand. You know, that's a lot to, uh, to really shoulder a burden of depending on the size of the property and can really, uh, like I said, impact your overall operations at that property. Um, so like I said, that's all stuff that people don't always realize but it's great to talk to your agent about, discuss like the analysis of it, provide the accurate uh, you know, explanation to the lender and their insurance consultant to try to work on that stuff on the front end before you close the deal. So in the future, you can kind of just say, I've got comfortable, uh, I feel comfortable that I don't have to have any of these headaches later on. Um, Brad, can I ask a quick question here? I think uh, yeah. it's okay. What so understand? I understand your the point of you want to negotiate down on these these items, right? Can you can you kind of give an idea for let's just say for Central Florida, and I, that may be too general, but what kind of coverages do you recommend, or what kind of coverages are you seeing for for this area? And you know, how does that you know how much variance is that from let's just say some other market, or, or are they pretty standard? No, great question. So in the state of Florida, the biggest, especially Central Florida, you have some of the least amount of hurricane exposure there is. So your standard agency debt requirements are all going to be fairly, uh, fairly normal. Basically, the ones you're going to be concerned of, about are the deductible requirements. Because you're in Florida, you're going to have a uh, fire deductible requirement, which gives you a maximum of let's say, depending on the size of the loan, of a $5,000 deductible to a 25,000. Sometimes on smaller properties, that might only be allowed maybe a $10,000 deductible. And if you don't negotiate or don't, you know, try to push for the loan to allow for maybe a 25,000, that could be a concern in a couple of years because the way the insurance care, the insurance marketplace is going is they are charging to pull back their deductible offerings, offer higher amounts because they found that that low end is a very high loss area for them. And you might be paying a significant premium where you feel comfortable increasing those deductibles to 25,000, but your loans lock you into a 10,000. So I would say most things are pretty standardized. It really will come down to uh, how aggressive your insurance consultant for that lender is if you're using uh, agency of debt. So if you're using Fannie Freddie, you know, if you had with an Arbor, you know, with PNC, they all have a third party lender consultant or insurance consultant that's going to push for much lower requirements when you can accept that higher amount and give you that flexibility as your portfolio grows. When you have one property, it's usually not that big of a deal. But if you've got 20 properties on a policy, you might want to accept that higher retention and uh, you feel more comfortable because you have that economics to scale. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Cool. I no, appreciate it. Great question. Um, awesome. Yeah. So that's kind of the, how you determine what you're purchasing. Obviously, that's very important. And this is all stuff that I've seen every single the deal because somebody didn't understand that they have to purchase terrorism coverage or ordinance and law coverage or equipment breakdown. 
and I'll save you guys the, the full explanation, but I've seen people come back panicking at the you know, last second saying, can somebody help us get a quote that meets these requirements because our agent can't seem to figure it out and they're in jeopardy of losing whatever they're, you know, the money they have into it because they can't close in time. And, you know, that's just something you, you want to make sure you're, you're staying away from and working with somebody who understands uh, that ahead of the schedule. So after that, I'll talk to you about kind of achieving the best quote because that's why we're all obviously here, right? You want to make sure you're getting the best result because you have to buy it. You need to get the you know, most aggressive pricing. Or if you are, you know, you need to have an agent that can deliver you the options that you can weigh the cost benefit analysis of to choose what you feel comfortable with, what meets your requirements, what meets your cash flows. So a lot of people don't, they think kind of uh, the insurance process is, is this whole crazy thing going on and don't ever really, uh, Get fully explained how it works because I think once you understand this, you understand why all the questions that people that agents ask is are important because they're trying to get you the best cost. So the traditional process to get you a quote is you select your agent, make sure you select that wisely because that agent's going to be portraying you in the marketplace, and you can only select one agent per carrier to take your information to market. And that's important because if you have a bunch of agents in the marketplace, they're going to you know, butt heads against each other. They're not going to be able to negotiate terms with you. It's going to lessen carriers kind of uh, confidence that they are giving a true chance um, instead of saying, oh, you've got one carrier, but you don't know what the targets are. The second part is that agent will assemble a submission, which is an overview of your opportunity. You have a hundred unit property in Orlando that's class C that you know has had no losses. So if that agent just says 100 unit property, please quote, well, that's not really a full story of what you're trying to portray. Whereas other agents will put together, like I said, a very detailed submission saying it's 100 units, they've got a great management style, they've got a clean loss history, they've got, you know, uh, 10 other properties that they are currently managing. So they have a great experience. This is what their portfolio looks like. Here's the opportunity to grow it. You know, really tell them the whole story about you and why you're different. These, these uh, underwriters have hundreds of deals that are getting thrown at them left and right. And if they don't see some reason why this one either deserves the attention or deserves special treatment, deserves more aggressive pricing, they'll just throw out a number and if it binds and it's 40% higher than what they could have done, they're happy, but you're not happy because you're, you know, you're throwing out that money that you could have also made on the deal. Um, and that's why all this information that, you know, you give the agent is going to be portrayed to the carrier and that needs to be, uh, you know, you need to have the best information. Once that information is assembled in a submission, the carrier will, perform their wind and fire modeling. And that gives underwriters a baseline guideline of what they can really offer as far as pricing and terms. If they have poor information, it'll model poorly. And if it models poorly, you might be starting 30% higher than what everybody else is because they gave better quality submission. Once they have that baseline, they then will apply their debits and credits to increase or lower the premium. Uh, depending on the story and the additional factors you tell them. And then your agent takes those deals and they broker it amongst the other markets to give you the best result to discuss. So that's kind of the, the overall process. And just as a kind of visual, I showed you've got your agent and you have your wholesaler, which are two halves to a coin. Your agent is kind of client facing, wholesaler is carrier facing, and it's where the relationships you know, where you kind of focus your relationships, they come to the middle and they broker the deals on your behalf. So if you ever hear the terms agent and wholesaler, they are two different groups. They work in tandem in order to, you know, leverage their relationships. Whereas if you just had one agent that was trying to manage 100 relationships and 100 carrier relationships, that would not, they wouldn't be able to, uh, really have the pool with those carriers because they're too busy focusing towards the client. So you partner together in order to, you know, have 
each one focuses on clients or focuses on the carriers. Um, then some other just great little little tidbits to kind of throw in. You know, people don't realize that there's blocking in the marketplace. That's where that one agent to go out and uh, represent you is extremely important. Uh, if you have too many people out there, there's a lot of you know hands in the cookie jar. There's a lot of different data that's flying around the markets. There's uh, everybody could end up with a different piece to the puzzle type situation. Um, so really being uh, conscientious up front on who you select to represent you out in the marketplace, give carriers, uh, you know, confidence that they are the sole agent, that that agent knows what's going on is important because these carriers get burned all the time. Somebody comes in throwing some crazy story out there, you know, and uh, waste their time. And they are very sensitive to that because of the market right now and just because of, you know, what's going on um, as far as this hard market and is very few carriers that can really offer quotes in the state of Florida. Um, and then, you know, quotes are valid for about 30 days. So you really shouldn't expect too much. You can get general feedback and maybe where you're expecting to lie. But a lot of times formal quotes don't develop until about 30 days out from your closing. Just something good to keep in mind. Uh, and then there's two different types of carriers, but we can talk about that at different times, kind of more high level. But uh, in the state of Florida, they're all non-emitted. So just some, in case anybody ever talks to you about that, they're concerned about a non-emitted carrier, it's industry standard. It just means that they are not uh, regulated by the federal government in order to, uh, they can adjust their costs and coverages year after year without any restrictions. But because Florida is what's called a cat environment, uh, they're susceptible to big hurricanes and shock losses, that gives those groups flexibility to uh, increase premium, change deductibles based off of what the market demands. So nothing to ever be concerned about, but I've had that question pop up from now and then, uh, especially if you're coming in from a different market, say, you know, Ohio, where they're all admitted carriers and everybody feels more comfortable with it. To be honest with you, non-admitted is, is very good carriers. It's basically what everybody in Florida writes. So after that, talking about the submission information, just to give a real visual representation of how you get a better result, it's how you fill in this chart right here. You know, the more information you give your broker and you can, you know, tell them and how to represent your risk, this is half the battle. Because every piece of information you submit on here goes into a carrier's big, crazy computer system that will help win model and will give them that baseline rate. And just our understanding, rate times insurable value is how you get your price. You can either decrease your insurable value, which a lot of times you're kind of locked into, that's not really as flexible, or you can decrease your rate. This is your base. Um, just so you can kind of like get a, a better understanding, you know, some of the key ones are, is the property sprinklered? Uh, has it been updated? Um, is there, you know, what's the construction of the property? This one was Joyce and Masonry. Um, you know, what's the roof uh, structure part to it? And all these things, like I said, get uploaded in the system, you know, they will help determine where you're starting off at. That information, if you have less information, excuse me, carries default to the worst case scenario. So, you know, when that agent's asking for a lot of this stuff, like I said, they're probably asking for a good reason. And that reason's to get you to a better baseline. Because if they say, let's say they input half of this, send it to a carrier, and then they come back and say, oh, I got a whole bunch more information later they're gonna to have to go through another wind modeling process and then you're using up more of the underwriter's time and that's gonna make them want to get more premium for their time they put into it. So hopefully that kind of makes sense, right? The less time you can make them, the more happy they are and keeping them happy is the name of the game. And also that game of telephone. You wanna make sure when you tell the wholesaler to tell carriers, it's very simple for them and it's very clear. Um, so yeah, that's how the general submission process works. That, that is money right there. That is that, absolutely money. <laughs> it's so important because when this is, this is what makes all the difference. If this information is not filled out correctly, you might just get declined right off the bat. If it's filled out unfavorably, you're starting off already at a disadvantage. If it's filled out thoroughly and you know has everything there, that underwriter is going to take a look and go, that person knows what they're doing. I want to jump on their deal. I want to work with them. That underwriter is hearing from, you know, from the agent to the wholesaler, you know, this telephone game. How do they qualify how serious that person is of an owner? 
through uh, how else through than through uh, quality of information. And you know, they're an analytical based person. So that's what they resonate with. And that's going to, like I said, put you off on a much better starting point compared to everybody else out there. And that's how you get better money, better deductibles, better everything else. Um, so just cannot preach to how, how important quality of data is. So after that, general rule of thumb is, you know, one of the first things that they're going to look at on that schedule is your building construction. Almost everything, uh, every type of apartment complex will fall into one of these four categories. You have your frame, which is a wood construction, uh, exterior walls, wood roof, joist and masonry, which is a little bit better, brick walls, better against wind, but uh, wood roofs, which means still susceptible to a fire. Fire happens in one unit, it will run up to the roof, set the whole structure on fire. You've got masonry non-combustible, which is not extremely common for apartments, but basically it means the roof is probably some type of metal, which is less fire resistant and the walls are concrete block as well. And finally, you have your fire resistive, that's your high rises, any type of large uh, condo structure you see in a lot. And those are gonna rate your most favorably, but obviously they are gonna be very expensive. You probably aren't gonna see them as much kind of in the central Florida area. You see those more uh, coastal or downtown areas. And like I said, those are kind of more your simple stuff. It's more that frame and joist and masonry where majority of garden style apartments are. And uh, those ones are tricky to be honest with you because one little fire, one little, uh, somebody goes to bed at night with a cigarette in their hand and falls asleep and that thing will go up in two seconds. And carriers are concerned about that type of stuff because you may pay $25,000 in, but if they have one loss, that could be a million dollars to rebuild. And we see it all the time. It takes that carrier how many you know dozens of years to you know, recoup that loss, and that's what's really driving all these costs because things these things just go up like kindling in two seconds. So after you, know, you talk about the construction quality, the other way to really reduce that cost is in your wind modeling and your uh, the submission information, like I said. But what I really want to talk about is the main points. If you don't if you aren't able to find everything. That's fine. The biggest pieces that are going to have the most impact is what I wanted to really highlight. In order to improve wind modeling, because you've got your fire and wind, right? Fire is based off of your construction. Wind is based off your roofs. Your year the roof was replaced, that's the absolute minimum, most crucial piece of information to find. Your agent can try to guess, but the newer that roof is, it's going to have night and day impact on how these things uh, model up. And then the second thing is impact resistant features. If you've got hurricane proof windows, you've got hurricane proof doors, that's, you know, very important as well. And then the last piece is hurricane roof attachment points. So this is, you know, a lot of people aren't going to know this stuff, right? But this is what's going to save you 10% on your premium cost, because these are the questions that that underwriter is asked. And that underwriter has to say, for their, uh, you know, roof roof anchorage, is it attached A nails and screws or unknown? Is it attached B clips or anchor bolts or C hurricane ties? Just changing that question could save you ten percent. You know, that's how drastic it can be. And people don't want to ask those questions, or maybe they don't know them on the front end. So it just instantly defaults to the lowest, uh, the lowest metric possible, which would be A. But you know, if you can answer one question and prove your you're pricing that much, I think it's, it's probably worth it, right? Um, especially with the cost in Florida. So that's just stuff to kind of keep in mind. It's good to put a, a checklist of all those questions. So you have that on your due diligence list to ask these types of things. And at the end of here, I put together a loose one. That's a good basic guidelines that I recommend a lot of my clients uh, tend to just walk around with it. If they see something, you know, it's just a good quick little checklist to, to try to help on that type of stuff. But it's always important to be looking for these types of things because that's what's going to make the difference in your pricing. Uh, so the, the next thing I have here is that these other common premium drivers. After those modeling types of things, the carriers look at losses. A property that has uh, a lot of frequent losses tends to be a uh, sign that it might have, might be leading up to one large severe loss. You've got 
three or four fire losses over the last five years, there's a good chance if all those are maybe $5,000, well, if that keeps happening, one of those is going to be a million dollars. And that's what the carriers don't want to see. If you just have one, maybe, uh, I guess I should back up a little bit too. This is off of what's called your, your hard copy loss runs that a seller will provide to uh, show the carriers of that, that, sorry, the new carriers, what the track record of that property looks like. Um, so if it's had a lot of losses, had a lot of issues to it, the, car the new carriers are gonna wanna see that information because they're always looking off of historical information to project future losses. Um, so if you have frequency issues, that tends to be a problem. If there's a one-off fluke loss, you can usually write that off with a good story. You know, an explanation, hey, we had a million dollar hurricane loss, but it came with new roof, new, uh, you know, impact resistant doors, windows. We got a whole new interiors. We did all the piping, the uh, electrical systems. You know, th this property, yeah, it may have that loss, but you should throw it out because now it's basically a brand new property. And that happened to one of my clients. Uh, they had a 1980s property, had a huge loss in 2008. Everything was replaced. Well, all of a sudden that thing is rating like a 2008 build. Um, so a good story really helps make that difference. Right. Um, I have a question real quick. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm ahead of the game here or not, but um, with the recent collapse of that building in uh, South Florida, um, how much of that is covered? Um, and are they a, will they be able to rebuild? Um, will the income also be covered um, with that situation? Great question. So there's a couple pieces to that. What a lot of people forget is a condo is a little bit different than a traditional multifamily apartment. That condo, I think, had 15 million of uh, liability limits. And I think it, you know, the property of it might have been whatever the actual rebuild value of the structure is, which might be, let's say, 30 or 40 million. So that carrier will be on the hook to rebuild the structure for 30 or 40 million. But condos don't usually carry uh, income coverage because you're not, uh, a lot of people elect to not cover their income when they own the property because they don't want to pay the extra premium and they're actually living in it. For an investment property, your lenders require you to carry it because if there is a loss, they want to make sure you can make your mortgage payments. But if you're just owning your own internal condo, you probably don't care about the rental income and you don't want to pay that increased cost. So there's a good chance they were not purchasing any type of rental income coverage and there probably will be no income paid uh, paid out to any of the tenants for the, the actual rents of it. Wow. Now, the liability piece to it is a little bit different because there's probably 15 million limits. Well, 15 million limits across uh, 138 people who passed, which is very unfortunate. It's not going to be a significant sum of money to pay for all the medical bills for the living people, to pay for the, you know, uh, to, to help ease the loss of the people who lost family members. It's going to be eroded very quickly, and they're going to have to choose a way to, to divvy that up in a, as proportional as possible. But like I said, 100 and I think 30 something people, if not more, and God knows how many were injured, that limit's gonna go very quickly. And uh, it's very unfortunate, but that is going to set a big precedence in the future for what people have to purchase as far as limits of insurance, what carriers want to offer for coverage there. Uh, I think it's already pushing for more, uh, I think like 20 year, um, surveys instead of just 40 years but great question because it's, it's going to have a huge impact moving forward right. That, right. that carrier honestly they, they already even that carrier pulled out from any building that is over 25 years old across the u.s it's a group called great american so it's completely shaped under or changed their underwriting guidelines so um, that, a, a building that's over 20 25 years that person that's purchased you know thinking about purchasing that property may have a hard time finding good insurance Yep, exactly. Now, there's still a lot of carriers that will uh, insure that structure, and there's still a bunch of good groups out there. That's one that flat out said, we had such a bad loss, we're pulling out. In the uh, what's called the cat marketplace, there's probably 10 main carriers 
they were very much a lesser one of those 10. So it's not a huge loss, but the, let's say, nine-ish that were left over could have a big revamp on their guidelines to protect against something like that. Because they might have been paying 100 grand for their, what's called their all other perils deductible. And that could have been a $40 million loss. You, you just do the math on that. that that's going to take forever to, to repay. And, uh, you know, people want to avoid that any way possible. Okay, so this property you say was condos, but there are uh, several properties in Florida that's mixed. Some are condos um, and some are, um, I guess, residential uh, mixed. Um, how, how does the insurance cover that? So usually the owners uh, of the rental units tend to elect to, uh, coverage, to cover their rental income. So they would get indemnified for rents. So when it comes to that type of coverage, there is your, uh, there's three types of insurable values, more or less. There's your building value, which is a certain dollar amount to rebuild that structure. There's your contents or business personal property, which is your limit to uh, replace outdoor fixtures, uh, lawn chairs outside, uh, trees, um, any type of outdoor item that kind of goes into operating in that structure. And then there's your rental income. You can assign rental income per unit on condos. So the person who owns half those units, if they're a large multifamily owner, they were probably electing to purchase uh, income coverage for their portion of the structure. And while that building is being rebuilt, they'll get paid for income coverage throughout the time frame. And then when that building's uh, completely uh, rebuilt, they might have something called extended period of indemnity which that coverage will give them coverage for maybe three months, six months, a year uh, of rental income until they're up, they're leased up and fully occupied again. It's a very important coverage. It's great to have. It's usually not very expensive, but it will give you time to re, uh, rent that property and give you coverage uh, to still pay your bills because traditionally the goal of insurance is to indemnify you. Indemnify you is to make you whole if that building was rebuilt and those units were able to be re-rented, that qualifies as indemnification. Now that coverage is to, to give you that time period to then uh, find new tenants and new, new individuals to live there. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, great question, because that, that has become a huge uh, conversation in the market. And it's going to, like I said, have a large impact. Condos are, are definitely a little bit on the different, uh, different end of things, because you have those associations that are not held to the same rigorous standards um, of liability that a multifamily owner is. Multifamily owners have to answer for negligence and for if something were to happen, you know, if, if that building, if you guys were managing it and, and it, you own a good portion of it, and you control what the coverages were. If something were to happen, they could potentially say you pushed the hand and made them buy lesser coverage and go after you. A condo owner, it's like if there's all individual owners and their policies are exhausted. Who do you go after, the HOA? Well, they are part owners of the HOA, so you're taking it back out of your own pocket. Um, so that's that's a big difference and a great question, like I said. So uh, yeah, so after, after uh, the loss history portion to it, there's electrical wiring and electrical paneling. Uh, basically every property from prior to 1965 and post uh, 1975, has copper wiring. Some properties built between 65 and 75 have aluminum wiring. Mm -hmm. Aluminum wiring is highly, uh, uh, has a high prob probability of causing fires because it doesn't conduct properly, properly, excuse me, and has to be remediated. If your property has unremediated aluminum wiring, that could be a big red flag to a lot of carriers. They won't offer quotes. They might give you a, uh, they might say, hey, you have to remediate this. And if you have to remediate it, that can be an incredibly expensive process on top of already paying for a much a more expensive policy. And if you're not factoring that into your underwriting and being aware of that and proactively knowing that stuff, that is a huge uh, shock that might really affect what your underwriting cash flows are. And we see it all the time. It blows deals up. I saw one individual who was buying a property in Georgia underwrote for, I think, $300 a door because Georgia costs are low ended up paying for about a year and a half, maybe I think it was like a thousand dollars a door. Uh, you know, 
how do you how do you try to justify that when you're at the finish line saying to your lender, hey, we need to wrap this up in a week, but our insurance numbers are all off. Um, they fortunately were able to make it through, but I can tell you what, they fired their broker next year and <laughs> we worked with them as a client for a while. So you see that stuff all the time. Um, the next other part of that is federal Pacific paneling. That's another big fire hazard. It was built around the 70s and 80s. It can be somewhat common if it hasn't been remediated uh, and hasn't been replaced with, uh, usually it's like GE type of paneling. That can be a uh, big issue that you can get dinged for premium or that can restrict the number of carriers that will offer quotes to you. You know, there's not a big pool. If instead of nine carriers, you've got five carriers, that's just going to, you know, I mean, they can push premium more because there's less people that are willing to jump on the risk. Um, geographical restrictions, barrier islands are way more expensive than interior Orlando, just a way higher, you know, exposure. There's the Tri-County box, which is uh, Palm Beach County, Miami-Dade, and Broward. If you're in there, <laughs> rates are not the same as if you're in uh, Jacksonville. It's much more, you know, expensive in that area, and a lot of people don't realize that until like you said, they're a little bit further on the process and it catches them off guard. Um, so those are the two big ge geographical areas for Florida. Closer to the coast, more expensive, more inland and more north, it rates tend to go down some. Um, insurable values, like we talked about, you know, handle that beforehand, just get those as low as possible. So you can choose what limits you want to purchase. I have a client who didn't do that before their loan. The carrier required about 40% or the, sorry, the, uh, lender required about 40% higher than what even the construction budget was for a new property. Well, their previous agent didn't negotiate that. They're paying 40% more for their insurance than they need to. And we did a whole big thing. But the fact it was a year late, the lender said, hey, so sorry, we don't want to do it. You know, we're comfortable with this. So sad. Uh, the other part about that is higher insurable value. Your hurricane deductible is based off of a percent of the insurable value. Higher insurable value raises your deductibles. People don't realize that. So you're just, it's a double whammy and you just want to fix that. So you have the flexibility to make that choice on your own and you're not locked into it by somebody else's requirements. Because also when you go to sell that property, if you can drop your insurance costs by 40% because you're looking to sell it at the end of your loan, how does that impact your cash flows, right? That could save you a ton of money, make you a bunch more money to sell it when that's just for one year you took less coverage when for the other nine, you took as much as you want. Um, just stuff like that, that has an impact. Uh, fire devices, you know, a property that is one big building that's 100 units continuously that has no sprinklers, no firewalls, no uh, central station fire alarm systems. That building with one bad fire could all go up in flames. That's a huge potential maximum loss for a carrier. And they, they look at that type of stuff. So you want to make sure you're notating any fire, uh, fire mitigation efforts because it's just another credit that person can apply to drop that pricing or it's another uh, guideline change they can make to get you more access to more carriers. Um, security systems, if you don't have a gate, anybody can wander on the property. If you've got cameras, they slip and fall. Uh, that carrier has evidence to say, uh, you know, that didn't happen as a result of negligence. Great example of that is we had a client who had a property where the tenant walked on, they took a gun to their ankle. This is a bit graphic, pulled the trigger, said, hey, I got shot in a drive-by shooting. They did this three times until they finally got caught by a security camera making a million dollars a pop. And the last one was in front of the security camera. The carrier was able to pull that tape. They said, hey, we've got proof that you did this yourself. It wasn't negligence by our client. Well, they lost everything because of that. So it's little stuff like that that can really help your uh, your pricing and numbers because gives the carrier tools in the case of a loss. Um, update information, electric and plumbing. You like to know that those are updated in the last 25 years. Otherwise, it's kind of surprising. Most properties that are bought in turn have been updated like that. Uh, tenant basis, subsidized and student. Some carriers don't like to see that. Uh, most carrier, Market rate is great. That's what apartment programs are put together for. But if it is one of those two, that could uh, bounce outside of carrier's guidelines. And usually the common rule is 30% of the tenant basis. More than 30%, it uh, can go outside of guidelines. Then there's crime scores, which is just the general uh, performance of that zip code. And the last one that I'd like to throw in there is the average unit size. People don't realize a larger unit is more attractive. It sells better, you know, rents better. 
that is going to increase your average cost, larger unit, more square footage, more insurable basis, more per door cost. So if you're looking at a property and it's got a thousand bucks, you know, a thousand square feet a unit, that's not going to be the same per door cost as a, you know, 500 micro unit, 500 square foot micro unit thing. And some people tend to write them all as 400 bucks a door or something. Um, so that can surprise some people. Well, well, that's it. That settles it. I'm going for just studios at this point. Yeah. Well, per door cost looks good, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's just something good to know. Um, so we've seen a lot of estimates we, we throw out there and people don't expect that. And then that comes back and be a, a big conversation piece. So, yeah, but, uh, Hey Brad, quick question on the crime uh, there. Yeah. What do you guys use to, is there a way for someone to kind of gauge um, what the crime rate is for an area? I know there are certain tools that people use, uh, free, free tools that will kind of give you an idea. What is, what, is the, uh, your, what is the underwriter or the carrier using? Yeah, so the, the general rule of thumb is a group called bestplaces.net. They've got, you just type in the zip code, it'll pull all the crime information from the area. It'll give you violent and property crime score. Uh, if the violent crime is over a certain amount, you might have uh, coverage reductions on the general liability side. Uh, they might uh, like sublimit assault and battery. Some carriers might not want to write in that area altogether. If the property crime score is over 80 as well, some property carriers don't want to write that because high chances of arson. Um, you know, you see those in various areas, but if you just go on that bestplaces.net, it's a great resource. You just type in zip code, go to crime, and it'll be right there for you. Um, it's also something we do in all of our estimates. We check ahead of time. We check the, the crime scores, and we also look for crime articles referencing that park property because you may not be aware that there was three shootings at it over the last four or five years that was never disclosed to you. But if you type in that property and you know shooting or death or something in that you know similarity, you might be able to find a crime article and that can help you uh, as far as what to expect for the loss history for that property. It's a great question. Thank you. Hey, Brad, maybe yep. you said it already, but is this list in order of the impact, potential impact to the premium? For example, is loss history like, you know, typically a larger driver than crime scores or? Yes. Uh, so loss history is typically one of the largest that can because uh, that, that's going to be fact. If you have $2 million worth of losses on a property that's only paying 50 grand a year, how's that carrier supposed to make money if you have another one of those? That's definitely the number one. Uh, electric wiring and paneling, that's more of like a guideline restriction. If you have this type of stuff in the property, that could just completely slash out some carriers. And the ones that may right there may ding you with rate, or they may only offer like a $100,000 fire deductible until that stuff is fixed. Um, geographical restriction is, you know, probably more cost prohibitive than the electrical wiring. Uh, but that's extremely important closer to the coast, more money you're going to pay, uh, with, as also with, you know, age and quality construction. And then the rest of these are kind of more, uh, you know, after a short values, excuse me, are more, right. they can improve stuff on a more minor okay. margin. Okay. That helps. They all contribute. They're all. Yeah. Well, so, right. so there's, there's effects on the rate which are kind of the upper right. ones. And then there is the credits that carriers can apply. Right. So better crime scoring, better, you know, updated plumbing, fire protection devices might qualify for credits, which then that underwriter can apply uh, okay. to help reduce the cost, reduce the rate. Yep, yeah, that helps. Great. Thank Great you. Great question. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so you got the next uh, surprise cost we see kind of frequently is flood zones. Uh, and this is that third portion of the coverage, right? This is a coverage a lot of people don't think about. It's something that um, that can be a significant cost if not aware of upfront and if not negotiated with the lender. So the reason I say this is because if you guys can see that little red box, that is area of minimum uh, flood zone. That's zone X. Most properties are going to con be considered zone X. I mean, they're not in a high hazard flood zone. It might be this orange shading, which is uh, X shaded. I don't know why it's there. It's It's a very... It's the same thing. Now, this blue areas are where you're gonna be concerned. If your property is touching any of those, that lender is going to require flood insurance, which is very expensive to be purchased on that property. The trick that people don't know all the time is there is a, you know, there's potential for that flood zone to be on a property that is built up out of the uh, flood zoning 
which is a elevation that the carrier or the, the FEMA, uh, the, the national government has determined anything below this certain elevation is at high risk for flooding. But if you buy a property that's 2010, well, that individual building the property was required to build up out of that flood zone, but FEMA doesn't determine, or the lender doesn't determine that. You have to petition it for a LOMA and you have to get a group to put together the documentation to remove that coverage. And that's gonna remove a huge burden that could re greatly reduce the cost that you're looking at in the T12s or what everybody else is looking at. I mean, it, it can be 20, 30 grand. I've seen a property was 40 units in Galveston, Texas, paying 15, 20 grand in insurance for flood alone. You know, that's huge. So if you know, and it qualified for, for a Loma, and that could have made a massive reduction in the overall cost for it. And nobody knew it until we took a look and had a group come out and look at that. So those, uh, yeah, we even looked at one that had that, Ray, that had that uh, the flood zone. <laughs> Yeah, it's just something. Can some, you tell them what LOMA stands for? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Sorry, that's a letter of map amendment. That is a uh, formal document that lets lenders and lets the uh, flood carriers know that the property is built up high enough to be above the base flood elevation that would be considered a high hazard flood risk. So these are all just geographically done through large, you know, scanning of the the terrain. They don't take into characteristics such as the building's, uh, you know, pad that lit raises it that the property is actually built on. This is just a flat one. That's why you see that floodway. If anything's touching that, I mean, if you are one quarter lightly touching that structure or that uh, that zoning, the whole building is considered in a flood zone, and you're paying astronomical cost. Um, so unless you get that amended, like I said, it could be a huge tool to reducing cost. Yeah, and when we were looking at the uh, the the broker initially didn't know that there was an existing <laughs> loma, which is a, a you know if you get in that situation you can uh, you can potentially have a much better underwriting and have a better offer than someone else that thinks that there will be a flood flood zone uh, insurance uh, requirement. So, and uh, I guess the the actual uh, what it's what is is a letter of map amendment. Yep. Basically, it tells everybody that instead of an X or an AE, it's an X, which the two high hazard flood zones are AE and VE. Um, and if you can prove to them that it's an X, you're off scot for, you know, free and you don't have to carry that cost. Or what's something that a lot of people don't know is you can still purchase those flood policies if you're worried about a flood risk just for a fraction of the cost. Instead of being 20 grand, you might pay 750 bucks a building. And a lot of people do that, and it's all outside of your loan numbers. It's on a discretionary basis, whatever you choose to purchase. Still keeping that coverage and that, that fantastic coverage in place, but for way less money. And uh, and the Loma, if you if you think that a property qualifies for that, what what is the process? Do they go to do they go to an agent and and start that process, or how does that work? So we've got a group that we partner with. Um, and if you ever have any questions, you can always ask me about it and we can try to direct you and send you the information. But it's part of our underwriting process is we go to uh, FEMA's website, put in the address and you can see a, a mapping just like this. If we know, such as the group that's the little red square, that it's not touching it, you're free, you know, you're, you're off scot free. If it's close, we reach out to those flood consultants and have them take a look and see what their thoughts are. If they can't determine off of that, then you need what's called an elevation certificate. And a lot of times a seller is going to have one of those already because they were required to carry it for their loan. Uh, if not, that group can come out and shoot the elevation certificate and determine what that base flood elevation is for the property. And they can make you know, a guess or an understanding if they think it'll qualify for the loan or not. To put it in layman's terms, if your property is the base flood elevation is eight feet above sea level and your property is 12 feet at the lowest floor, yeah, it's going to qualify. If it's, you know, 8.2 feet and it's eight feet, it might not make it, but they know all the rules. FEMA is an incredibly, it's a government program, right? It is a incredibly complex group. You really want to rely on those close situations to their expertise and their knowledge. But uh, it's something, again, we can always, you know, redirect you start those conversations, give you a high level opinions and, and get that done for you. So. Yeah. We had one too, if I remember correctly, Brad, that, that um, initially wasn't a flood zone, but we did the application and then got a lower, lower insurance, which really made the numbers 
much better than they were and, and made something that was penciling, e you know, even a better return for investors. So you can do it the other way too. Yeah. Yeah. No, great point. So if you, maybe you don't qualify to get out of the uh, flood zone altogether, but instead of it being a negative elevation, if your base floods eight, the lowest area around there is, is seven. That's what it was underwritten as. If they come out and shoot an elevation certificate and see it was 8.1 instead of eight, you're still in that flood zone technically, but you're technically high enough to get a cost that might be half what you're paying before. So even if they can't get you out of it, they can still improve the cost for it. Um, and again, just makes all the difference in the world when you're in one of those deals trying to get the competitive edge, trying to help reduce costs because you're paying for the same coverage. It's just way less money. And the great part about the group we work with is if they try and fail, it's no cost to you. Nice. So, you know, it's, it's a, a, there's no reason not to do it. It can only help you. It's a great question. Fantastic. Um, the last part of this I really wanted to go through is just kind of quick quote examples. You're going to look, if you buy deals at a million of these things, they all formatted a different way. I really recommend getting a general uh, knowledge of what the traditional insurance requirements for any agency debt is. Just looking at these, it, there's always going to be what the property values are. There's always going to be what the perils covered are. So you know what the, the policy is covering. You want to look at your deductibles, which are broken down into your uh, all other perils or your fire uh, deductible. So if there's a burn or the property is burned down, for example, this one would be 25,000. If there's a million dollar fire, you're paying 5,000 or 25,000, excuse me. Uh, there's the name storm, which a lot of people aren't familiar with, but that is basically if there's your tropical storm, hurricane, anything else that comes out there, there is a 5% uh, of the insurable value is what your deductible is with 100,000 per occurrence. We always uh, negotiate our policies to be a per building deductible. A lot of people don't do that. They do a per location. To put that in terms of what it would mean is if you don't do a per building deductible, it'd be 5% off of 900 or 9.5 million. And that would be your deductible if one building got damaged. Now there's 20 buildings here. You know, our deductible would be 5% per uh, one, you know, 12th of those building values. And that's way less because what happens a lot of times is one building is damaged, not every single structure there. Tree falls, knocks down one building. If you have a per location deductible, it's 5% of that whole location. That's just astronomical. And a lot of people are caught very much off guard when they hear that fact. They think all those percent deductibles are the same. You want to clarify and make sure that happens uh, or that that is uh, turned in because it's usually a very small cost to have that included. And it could save you. I have a client who, uh, what, they had um, uh, one building damage for a million dollars on their property, or maybe it was 500,000 roughly. And their deductible for every single structure was like 2 million. But because that one building was only one damage, the deductible was 50 grand. They made like 350 grand where they would have not been paid anything. So cannot express how much that makes of a difference. Um, the other part is that there's the, all other wind hail, which is the one after that. That's basically any other type of wind event. Uh, these are definitely a little bit higher than I would say normal, which is about 25,000. But this client was going to save money and we negotiated with their kit lender to allow for $100,000 deductible so they could close that deal at the lowest cost and get their loan proceeds right. Um, then T3 is your terrorism, equipment breakdown, uh, and two below that's flood. I highlighted everything that's like a lender required coverage, except for cyber suite. I messed up on that one. Um, just to show you that like you need to find a quick way to scan these to make sure they meet your requirements. If you're not familiar with your uh, agent at the time, otherwise your agent should know that these are the types of things that, um, that you're always looking at to make sure you don't have any hiccups. The last piece of these though is there's your sublimits, which people often confuse and think they're additional limits to the coverage. A sublimit is a uh, enhancement that allows for additional uh, coverage to be there, but it's not on top of your original coverage. It's a lower amount that is provided. Uh, for example, if there's a flood coverage, if there's flood damage uh, to this property, the most you're allowed to have is 5 million. Now that 5 million isn't on top of your nine and a half million of building values. You just have 5 million. So it's sublimating coverage and it's a, uh, 
but it's an additional coverage that wouldn't have normally been included. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview there. I know we're getting a little bit late here. Uh, then I threw a general liability quote. This quote is very simple. It's very you know, easy to read. You've got your traditional 1 million per occurrence policy, your 2 million general aggregate policy, which means in the event of a loss, there's 1 million is the maximum amount that carrier will pay for that one singular loss. And it can happen up to twice. You could have four or $500,000 losses, but they won't pay more than those, that per occurrence limit. But that's where your umbrella carrier drops down to pay if you need to have a higher limit. One big coverage that we're seeing anymore is assault and batteries being sublimited. So they're offering lesser amounts, saying only 300,000 per occurrence or two, two 300,000 is one 600,000. Um, but you can scan those limits very easily. They're very simple, very common. But the biggest thing to look at with the uh, general liability coverages is the exclusions. And I highlighted too, you know, they've got a canine liability or canine limitation or a sublimit of liability for assault and battery like we just talked about. The reason that those are important is because if it's excluded in the underlying liability, it's excluded in the uh, other, the, the umbrella policy or the excess liability policy. The excess liability will always sit under the general liability or on top of it, excuse me, it will always be narrower. It'll always be reduction coverages. So the broader your general liability policy is, the broader it will make your umbrella policy, the more coverage you'll have. And sometimes you can get those coverages removed but those limitations removed, like the canine limitation, which is like if a dog were to bite somebody on your property, uh, by just showing a copy of your pet policy. Super simple, most people don't know that, it's costing no more money, but it's a uh, easy way to get that type of stuff removed for no additional cost. Um, so that's kind of the, those are the two main quotes that I just want to go over because that's what everybody will always be looking at. Uh, last thing is just kind of the state of the market. Um, honestly, things are getting tougher and tougher. It's a hard market for the first time after 14 years of a soft market. People are seeing big increases of 25 plus percent. You know, we see 50% increases sometimes. And the number one way to get that down is quality of data. Quality of data, improved underwriting metrics. Those carriers are trying to find out how to differentiate the better risk from the worst ones. And that's through data and through information. Um, we'll see what this market looks like in three or four months when we're through hurricane season. We don't know what the next big change will be and the next big concern for carriers and uh, underwriting factors will be, but there's gonna be a new one. Um, and we'll see that once we come out of hurricane season. Hopefully it will be you know, all nice, no big storms, no big losses. But if there are a bunch of big losses, that's gonna further deplete carriers reserves that they uh, have the payout claims. And they're gonna have to find ways to get that money back. And that's through increasing premiums. Um, Last part of it is kind of on the liability side. That's a quick synopsis of the property side. Florida is getting more, to, uh, they're getting more litigious in a lot of these liability claims. More litigious means the insurance costs for defense lawyers and everything are going up. That is uh, increasing the payout for these claims. Florida GL rates have been 40 bucks a door maybe two years ago. Now they can easily be $150 per door, uh, you know, even higher than that. And that is not slowing down until something is put in place to kind of stabilize these claim payouts. Uh, once that kind of happens, when some laws start to come out and something starts to reform how this goes about, there's going to be pretty tough time uh, with the general liability market on top of the already hardening property market. So that's just kind of two quick, uh, quick uh, blurbs about what we expect to happen. If things do start to stabilize and, you know, we don't have all these big losses that keep coming, huge storms, situations like that. We're hoping that the market will start to stabilize uh, as far as pricing goes, which will then allow more carriers to jump back in once they see the profitability of it. And when they see that there's profit to be made, that's going to create competition, drive costs down, give us more options. But until then, it's about differentiating yourself uh, to the carriers that are left there, left standing, quoting Florida for the time. So the uh, Last thing here I'll give you guys, I, I've mentioned this a little bit before. I really recommend putting together some type of quick little due diligence checklist whenever you're looking at a property, thinking about it. If you don't send everything to your agent, you know, take a look through it. Something like this is great when you do your walkthrough, just good to have on hand. I put together a, a little quick, simple one, but I have you know, a lot of clients that 
will have their own and just they, these traditional questions that you're going to be asked just so you can be proactive on it and like I said avoid kind of surprises and changes um this is just an example of one that I, I put together really fast so yeah that's uh that's all I got and that was a bit of a long one there so appreciate y'all for bearing with me Brad no this is this is fantastic one one thing I think is important and I know I had to go through this process a little bit, understanding the difference between a quote and an estimate and the timelines associated with, with those. I think you mentioned the quote about 30 days out. When yep. should someone reach out to an agent, to you, with a potential acquisition so they can get a, a sense of what, what the cost will be for insurance? Great question. We really recommend, you know, everybody tries to get proactive with it sometimes a little bit too far. And it, it takes a lot of time. We look through numerous aspects of every single deal uh, in order to make sure we're turning over every stone because that shock cost, if there's something we find, can be so great. But when you're actually looking at a deal and you're kind of moving forward, maybe you're about to go hard on it, that's usually when we recommend bringing in your, uh, your agent to really provide that additional cost benefit analysis. I would say out of, you know, 25 deals we look at, maybe one of those will have that kind of shock cost or will really uncover something big. A good portion of them will be pretty close to what the traditional one is. You just don't want to go hard on that one deal that has that shock cost. So once you get to that closer timeline, that's when we usually recommend it. Um, once you do go hard, you've got the deal on a contract, you've got your money down, that's when the quoting process, submission process all begins. And we try to get things to our clients as ahead of the time as possible. But choosing an agent that deals in uh, multifamily specifically and has that volume of transactions. I mean, we're looking at hundreds of deals a week. We're quoting these carriers. We're, you know, on a first name basis with these underwriters. We know without any surprises and any crazy modeling dynamic what that rate's going to come in at roughly. So you can feel pretty confident in your estimate uh, based off of their experience and their, you know, their relationships with the marketplace. This, this, Brad, this has been great. I'm going to open it up to see if anybody else has any other questions. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. All right. I think, uh, I think we've asked our questions along the way. So cool. I won't keep you any longer. One thing I will uh, just kind of bring out to the group is that our next meeting is September 20th, um, same time, 8 p.m., uh, and um, I look to I look forward to seeing folks showing up for that. I got to put out a I, I'm still waiting. I got a couple of feelers out for a speaker, but I'll put that out to make sure we get the, the the folks in place that they're the type of like I mentioned the quality of, of speakers is, is is key and not just quality. It's people that I do business with because um, it's it's easy to just grab somebody from somewhere, but you know I, I can attest to Brad because. We've done business and he's looking for deals for us. I mean, not deals, but he's looking to provide the estimates and, and do the work. So uh, I'm happy to be able to also share share some love by having you out here. And hopefully this helps you also get some additional additional work. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. You're always been a pleasure to work with. And uh, if any guys have questions, you know, we want to be a partner. We want to be a trusted resource. Uh, our clients have so many things going on, balls moving in their court. We don't want insurance to be another you know, thing that you're concerning about, another hat you have to wear. Uh, there's so many different people you can work with and you make that choice. Uh, if you've got to manage them and, you know, you have to be concerned about what they're giving you, give us a chance and, and let us, you know, kind of show you how we work and where our difference really comes from. And, you know, hopefully we can build that trust and be that partner for you guys and, and help take that focus off so you can just grow. That's our goal. So appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about this. And if you have any questions or anything I can ever talk about, feel free to call me anytime very accessible. So. Perfect, Brad. Thank you very much. So what we'll do now is uh, we'll transition to just an open forum. Um, and one thing that I always forget to say, but I think is important is remember that we are in this to invest where it makes sense. So hopefully this has helped you with that. This has helped uh, with some potential deals uh, and looking at deals in a different way uh, and a way that would make you more competitive. So thanks again, Brad. And I guess uh, you can stick around if you want or just for an open session or we just see you the next time we got a deal going on. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate it. And I'll, I'll let you guys have it. Thanks.